given given the political environment, given the constraints that we live in in, in the real world, how do we get a strong workout buddy and, and kind of ditch the wimpy ones that, that Congress has? Because clearly there's a need for solutions as much as there's a need for a diagnosis of the problem. I mean, I think part of the problem is that members of Congress have an electoral incentive to wait until a crisis occurs to actually take action. Whether or not that action is actually effective is a separate matter. But to actually implement serious budget reform, uh, members of Congress are going to wait until to, to the last minute. Um, so there has to be a change in the uh, electoral picture where members of Congress feel that they have an incentive to create these rules. And in fact, they might actually have a political incentive to do so. Because if they put into effect a constitutional budget rule that constrains their spending five years, 10 years down the road, five years from now, when they're running for re-election, they can say, look, this budget rule forces me to make these cuts. I don't want to make these cuts. I have no choice but to make these cuts. So it actually could be very shrewd politics to place a constitutional budget rule um, or a budget rule into the US Constitution because it hamstrings members down the road so that they have plausible deniability. Uh, but what that requires is political courage now. So if a group of electorally secure members of Congress were to push for uh, a spending limit uh, or a plan that was enshrined in the Constitution that would re require reforms to entitlements, that would force the hands of other members of Congress and help us get toward that, that fiscal discipline. Now, a lot matter the details are going to matter here. Uh, we've seen proposals come out of Congress for constitutional budget rules that won't accomplish much of anything at all because they're riddled with loopholes, um, and they amount to just uh, uh, political posturing. They're not actually going to solve the problem. You need a real budget rule that is in the Constitution that doesn't have very many exit options that's going to force members to actually bring spending down. Uh, and building on the comments that were made earlier, part of that has to be entitlement spending. Nobody wants to touch entitlement spending, but that's really where the explosion in government spending is going to be occurring. I'd like to do a quick poll of the, the panel, starting with you, Dr. Myron. If you're king for the day and you can offer up a single best solution, what would, what would be your first choice? Single best solution to? Our spending debt. problem and debt problem. Enact a sequence of series of changes in the entitlement programs consisting a sequence of changes in entitlement programs consisting of higher ages of eligibility of greater copays and deductibles in Medicare and even Medicaid uh, in freezing the real level of benefits in Social Security that this, th these changes don't affect people who are currently retired. They don't affect people who even who are five or ten years from retirement, but they start to affect people who are, say, 50 and, and younger and gradually shrink the amount of entitlement spending to, you know, the, the, and particularly the growth rate to a small fraction of its current projections. Dr. Yandel, what would you add to that? And it is, a, it is addition. I, I like Jeff's uh, suggestions there. Uh, there's one thing that uh, I would add, there's one thing that I would add in addition to what you're speaking of, and this would be procedural. Uh, to pass a statute that requires OMB annually in producing the budget for a particular year to list fiscal exposures, that is, the present value of every form of debt that the American people owe clearly stated in, in clear, simple terms. We do not get that. We know that we are on the hook for deposits, for example, through the FDIC. We know we are on the hook for retirement funds and so forth, but by statute requiring that. And then to have a, something similar to the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs in the White House that reviews fiscal activities as they are taking place within the context of the constraint that Jeff has spoken to to write assurances that the constraint is being adhered to. Dr. Primo? I would say that we need to have some sort of overall <coughs> limitation on spending uh, that forces legislators to do what households have to do every day, which is prioritize and say, look, here's how much we have to spend this year. Where can we direct those dollars? Because right now, the way budgets are made, despite the fact that we have these budget resolutions is everybody sort of throws in what they want and there's some grand agreement that's made and that's the size of spending. But why not start with an overall size of spending that's limited, okay, so some sort of spending limit, and then force members of Congress to then say, okay, given this budget, 
where should we direct our funds? I think that would go a long way toward getting the kinds of reforms that we aren't seeing right now uh, to entitlements. And I also would like to add that I agree with both of the other comments that were made. So, um, I mean, obviously, I agree with uh, it's hard to be last and seem original, right? Uh, <laughs> but I would add that actually it would uh, get all these entitlement programming tested. So only actually the people who really need these programs uh, actually get the benefit of, of them. I actually think that there's a lot of government spending tonight today that are going to a lot of people who really should be affording them on their own. Um, and um, I would like us to move to a system where actually we are a society that actually takes care of people who really cannot take care of themselves, rather than actually do a crappy job at taking care of people who really can't take care of themselves, but uh, because we're also taking care of everyone else. So. Thank you. And as much as I am enjoying asking the questions, I think we're moving in on uh, the last part of the program, and we need to open the floor for your questions. So if you can just raise your hand, I'll be glad to call on you, and we'll proceed right along. Yes, ma'am. Um, so I've seen, I've read indications that uh, U.S. debt is currently uh, at a lower interest rate than it would generally be, about 1% because uh, dollars are the general reserve currency. Um, so if the you know, world's reserve currency were to change, even if nothing else changed, then suddenly our interest rate would jump. Um, is there, number one, is that true? Um, and number two, uh, are there any warning signs, or what would be warning signs, that uh, other countries are going to start holding their reserves and things other than uh, U.S. debt? Can you speak to that, Dr. Yandel? Uh, I'll speak to piece, a piece of it, and I'm sure there are others uh, that, that uh, can most likely shed more light on the question than I might. But I think your summary is correct, which is to say we have extraordinarily low interest rates right now, partly because of the world being in a great recession and demand for lendable funds is very, very low. In addition to that, we have deflationary forces playing through the economy. Uh, bank called me yesterday, a day before yesterday and said, would you like to go into our savings account instead of with your checking account? And I said, tell me, what would I get paid? And they said, 0.5%. <laughs> so we have very unusually low interest rates. You're right. If we take the median family with two children in America in 2008, that family's earnings was $78,000. The amount of interest paid as a proportion of our budget in 2008 was 8.5%. For that family, that works out to $406 that this family is paying in interest with these extraordinary low interest rates. Now, we can do the arithmetic and say, okay, these interest rates are not going to stay at 0.5% for Yandel savings account or 1% on government bonds. Uh, they're going to double. They're going to triple. And if the riskiness of our debt begins to be perceived as serious by lenders worldwide, they would go even higher. Go back to the everyman family, their taxes would jump up proportionately. Instead of paying $406 in interest, they'd be paying $800 or $1,000 in interest. And so it is a serious problem, but you're right. It's not serious right now because the interest rates are so low. Now, I haven't spoken to the reserve currency, and so someone else. Jeff, you might want to speak to that. Someone. I think that the currency that ends up being the reserve currency ends up that way because most of the world has the most confidence in that currency. So I would sort of focus on where do people have confidence. I think sensibly people right now don't have a lot of confidence in any rich democracy, rich country, but the U.S. is still probably at the head of the pack, as Veronique was saying earlier. So I don't think we're going to lose that status in the near future, and that's a large part of why our interest rates are low, because there's still relative confidence in U.S. Treasury bills compared to, obviously, Greek Treasury bills or even French Treasury bills. So I don't expect it to change soon, but it's certainly possible. I mean, we... All the, these countries need to make adjustments, and depending on which ones do it faster or better, there could be some change in that status. Anything else to add? I mean, no. Next question, please. Yes, sir. Um, the Chinese have been very outspoken about the U.S. Uh, getting their financial system in order, and they proposed uh, something with, uh, like a new world currency. 
to move the to move uh, away from the dollar and to something similar to the euro. You think that's uh, that's uh, something that's going to be taken seriously in the next few years if the U.S. does not um, get out of debt? Dr. Deruji, would you like to speak to that? Um, I mean, I, I I cannot imagine that the U.S. would ever give up its independence and having its own currency. So I really don't think. I mean, like look at the Europeans; they're even questioning, right? the euros. I mean, so I just, I cannot imagine that this would ever happen. I would point out that that Chinese voice matters a lot, maybe not uh, leading to the conclusion that's suggested in your question. There is a reserve currency that is out there now. It's called special drawing rights. It's a part of the International Monetary Fund operation, and so there is a mechanism out there not to suggest that it's going to replace the dollar. I would never bet that it would, because that's a free market choice, too. But the Chinese discipline on our behavior showed up when the Congress nationalized Jenny May and Freddie Mac, and that came partly with influence from China because they were holding a lot of those bonds, and they're going to say, you've got to do something. So we're feeling that pressure is the point. Other questions? Yes, sir. By Paul Krugman on all the acolytes of stimulus, which is that the Keynesian model that they love so much says there are two ways to stimulate. One is to increase spending, and the second is to cut taxes. Almost all the advocates of stimulus are in love with spending, basically because they like the spending anyway. The spending is basically redistribution to interest groups that they favor the Green Lobby, the teachers' unions, on and on and on. Okay? But as we discussed earlier, it's hard to convince yourself that just building bridges to nowhere can possibly be good for the economy. If the government has good projects that it is not yet doing, if it really needed a bigger interstate highway system, then of course we should raise the appropriate taxes and build more interstate highways. But if you look at what transportation dollars are actually spent on, a ton of it is renovating highways two years after they were just renovated. A ton of it is beautification projects that are doing nothing for productivity, that are just somebody's pet idea. That has got to be bad for the economy. It's wasting resources. Tax cuts okay, in the Keynesian model are just as valuable a tool for stimulating the economy. And tax cuts, if you never heard of them, John Maynard Keynes, also are likely to stimulate the economy because they improve incentives. They mean that people keep more of the return from their savings. They keep more of the return from their effort in the labor market. And that encourages people to work harder, save more, do all the things that make the economy productive. So a way to sort of not even have to argue about the Keynesian models to say, we're going to do it via tax cuts, not via spending increases. Of course, what's going likely to happen is just the opposite. We're going to let the Bush tax cuts expire. That's a big tax increase. That's exactly the wrong thing for the economy. I think Dr. Primo also wanted to jump in on this question. I, go ahead. Do you want to, go ahead. You want to follow first? Go ahead. Um, go right no, ahead. I mean, okay. Ladies no, first. No, the answer is no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because here is why. Let's not forget we've already tried it the last two years, right? We've spent a lot of money. Direct spending in particular to the states and to contractors and things like this, it's reached almost $200 billion. It's not nothing. And then there's the entitlement part of the spending that went out. And then all those tax credits that you're talking about also went out, and yet we haven't had any results. One of the things that we need to understand is in order to create sustainable jobs, right, it has to come from the private sector. I mean, let's think about those jobs that were created in the states thanks to the stimulus money. What they've allowed to do is to um, they've allowed the states to prolong their bad behavior. The reason why they have budget gaps is not so much because of lack of revenue. It's because they've increased their spending dramatically. So while we have the feeling that we've saved these jobs, right, once the money ran out, these jobs are on the chopping block again. These are not sustainable jobs. And then let's talk about those tax credits that were extended. Small businesses have made it very clear. They don't care about tax credit because if they don't make a profit, if they don't have an, a revenue to use it against, those tax credits are completely useless. And finally, the most important, it's not that there isn't capital in the economy. In fact, according to the Federal Reserve, there's $1.8 trillion they're sitting on the sidelines. And the reason is very clear and expressed very clearly the reason why small businesses 
and families and individuals are not using this money is because of the uncertainty injected by government intervention. So what we need, it's not that Congress cannot do anything. Congress can actually do something very important, which is to basically stop introducing so much uncertainty in the economy, cut taxes, because the reason why people are uninvesting is because there's such a risk right now. When you know that on one hand the government is telling you it's giving you money but it's hitting you on, on the head with massive tax increases, let's not forget a third of small businesses report their um, business income on the, on, on, in the um, personal income tax. So these guys are going to be hit hard, right? And, and they're not acting. They don't want to move, and families are the same. So the government needs to kind of step away and stop introducing so much uncertainty, cut taxes, restore a stable economic environment that will actually lead to risk-taking and, and business activity in the U.S. I just want to build on something Veronique said about state and local governments, that state and local governments have been ratcheting up spending for years uh, thinking the good times are going to keep on rolling and tax revenues are never going to drop. And then when tax revenues drop, they didn't have a plan. And I think bailing out the state and local governments now would send exactly the wrong message, just as bailing out the banks uh, through TARP and other programs sent exactly the wrong message, that bad behavior will be rewarded. Um, so if we were going to have a stimulus, tax cuts would be a much better solution because the money goes straight into the pockets of individuals and bypasses governments, which introduce, as everybody knows, massive inefficiencies uh, in the allocation of monies. Uh, but I think it's, there's also, there's also, there's also a, sort of a principled reason not to help the state and local governments right now, and that is to send a message to those individuals that they need to be, those legislators and those governors, that they need to be responsible for their own fiscal houses, and they need to keep them in order, and the federal government is not going to be there to bail them out when they had been playing fast and loose with their budgets for years. Uh, just to give you one very quick example, many counties, many state governments have used settlements from uh, with tobacco companies that were supposed to be used to uh, ostensibly reduce smoking. Uh, they've been using that as essentially general revenue. They've sold off the future stream of payouts they're supposed to get from the tobacco companies, uh, and they've taken that money and used it for, to, to offset uh, otherwise, would otherwise have been budget deficits. Um, so rather than bringing down spending when they face budget shortfalls, they've been using all of these gimmicks. Well, now I think it's time that they actually have to take, uh, sort of have to take responsibility for those actions, um, and now is not the time for the federal government to bail them out. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Yano, you spoke briefly about um, the problem of private debt. Yes. Uh, um, now I was wondering if you might be able to uh, expand on that a bit. Uh, I've seen some of the numbers uh, yes. regarding private debt, uh, including the uh, ratio of household debt to GDP and uh, financial and business debt to GDP, both of which are higher than they were at the worst moments of the Depression. Yes. Um, if, in fact, the credit crisis of the past two years is, in fact, more of a debt crisis in that too many Americans simply cannot qualify to be loaned any more money. Um, how would you recommend we approach that? Because it seems as though the assumption this entire time has been that there should still be people qualifying and banks simply are sitting on the money. But if the problem is too much private debt, what can we do? Thanks very much. And uh, I mean, you, you have identified accurately and I think uh, inappropriately, the fact that what we're talking about is a debt crisis in the developed world um, and it now requires, to use that mouthful word, deleveraging. That is, we are in a period of time now where you wind down the debt, both personally and both for government and any other category. Uh, we've gone through a period of time, decades, uh, where the home equity line got invented, and so where we thought our income and our salaries was our budget constraint, suddenly we realized that we could go out and shop against any value in the home that we happen to own with respect to its equity. Then securitization of debt got invented, and so then uh, credit card debt 
that you and I might have incurred could be sold worldwide in credit markets. And so lo and, lo and behold, we could tap into the Chinese who were great savers. But in a way, we've hit the limits of all of that, not just us, but the developed world. There's something sort of peculiar right now. For individuals, when we think about individuals and our individual habits, it makes sense for us to go into debt when we are young. You build a lot of debt because your expectations are that your income is going to rise over your lifetime. You pay off debt. Then you get old and you got savings and you got cash. The odd thing right now is that the young countries are the ones that have savings and cash, and the old countries, the developed countries, are in debt. With respect to what does that mean, I think it means that you know, there's not any sugar to help the medicine go down. <laughs> there's not any pleasant uh, solution to this. It is true, as the banks have tightened their lending constraints under the auspices and under the influence of the regulators, uh, they have cash available for lending, but they have difficulty finding that creditworthy borrower. Those creditworthy borrowers will begin to show up once we begin to see GDP picking up again, and we will. And when we see unemployment falling again, and we will, there will be that remedy. But, but I, hate, I hate to be the one to say this, there's not a sweet solution to this, face, this problem that we face. Thank you. Gentleman here. Thank you. Um, I, it seems like I've heard some skepticism on uh, whether there would be a currency crisis. But don't you think that would be more likely than a debt default, considering that we could always expand the, the mon monetary policy or, or pursue an expansionary monetary policy? Uh, and if we're showing uh, a political weakness to control the debt to begin with, doesn't that kind of signal that we're going to have an expansionary monetary policy eventually? Well, I certainly think it's likely that we're going to expand monetary policy. It's certainly plausible as one way of addressing the debts, not just a different way of raising taxes, because it creates inflation. Inflation is a tax on the money that people hold. But that will also signal other countries that they don't want to hold dollar-denominated debt, make them demand higher interest rates, and therefore tend to precipitate a default situation. So, I, I mean, the, the things... Those two kinds of crises are so intimately intertwined. The U.S., as long as it lets the dollar float, is not going to have a classic currency crisis where we just run out of foreign res reserves of foreign currency. But people are going to stop wanting to hold the dollars, okay, dollar-denominated assets, and so we're not going to be able to bar continue to borrow to roll over the debt that we have, and that's when there's going to be a crisis. Yeah, and your question uh, prompts me to recall something you mentioned earlier, Jeff, that as a reference was made to an incredible piece of research uh, by Reinhardt and Logoff. The title of the book this time is different. It sounds like the title of a Gothic novel, but it's really that survey of 800 years of history where country after country has confronted a problem where someone in power said, oh, this time is different. We've got a gold reserve. Oh, we've got a balanced budget multiplier. This time is different. There's a, a risk, I think, where we in this room would say, this time is different. The Fed will certainly not just turn on the printing press and start printing money uh, to pay our way out of this debt. I would be inclined on the basis of that research to say this time isn't different, and there is a high risk. And I think Mr. Bernankian basically has been begging Congress to get the fiscal house in order so that the burden will not fall on the Fed uh, to turn on the printing press. Who, who again were the authors of that? Reinhardt and Rogoff. Carmen Reinhardt and Kenneth Rogoff. This time is different Princeton Press, 2010. And we are rapidly winding down, so we have time for just one more. So the gentleman right here in the nice blue shirt. Sure. Oh, thank you. Oh. <laughs> uh, I heard from the panel that it's a great idea to cut back on uh, spending, especially in the social programs on a macroeconomic scale. Um, how is one to understand how that would affect the individual, particularly if they're on um, the end of 99 weeks of unemployment, where the prospect of cutting social spending seems against their self-interest. Dr. Primo? I think part of this is that if we start dealing with the problem today, we can make cuts gradually. So I don't 
think, I don't want to speak for anybody else on the panel, but we don't want to say tomorrow, okay, we're going to you know, eliminate Medicare, right? That would not, that's not something that A, would ever happen, but B, not something that makes sense. You need to have a transition. Uh, but the problem is if we wait 10 years, 15 years to actually take action, the cuts we would have to make, the changes we would have to make would be just that much more dramatic. So I think by giving people time to adjust to a new reality where government will not be providing as many services as it has in the past, uh, you'll ease that transition and you won't have a situation where people feel like they've been told one thing and then the benefits weren't there. Uh, so I think the key is to have a transition, but we won't be able to have a transition if we reach a level of debt so high that all of a sudden we're at risk of defaulting in our debt and the government has to all of a sudden slash spending by 30% overnight. Um, that's a very different scenario and one which we would face uh, and are likely to face if we don't take action now. Um, again, but as I mentioned earlier, the problem is politicians don't like to take tough actions until their hand is forced. Um, so I think part of the job of those who are doing research on these issues is to suggest that, look, not acting now has real consequences for your constituents. And I see that our time is up, and so I think we'll probably leave it right there. Please join me in thanking the panel. And thank you so much for joining us today.